Hi everybody, Dr. Pingle here. This is LiDAR Part 3, Advanced LiDAR Visualization. So, so far we've been talking about um, LiDAR in general, what the data is, how it's organized, um, a couple of examples of how you can view it and work with it. Um, what I wanted to do next is, is sort of talk about some of the more advanced techniques for both processing and looking at the data. Since this is a GeoViz class, um, we're really going to be focused on the, the visual part. Um, but a lot of these tools have a lot of really great applications um, for, um, for, for data processing and sort of um, classification and, and sort of bringing a little bit more meaning out of it. But, um, but the visualization side is also quite important, uh, and that's why we're talking about it here. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, one of my favorite applications for um, working with LiDAR data is LAS tools, uh, sometimes called LAS tools. This is uh, a suite of toolkits uh, or a suite of tools developed by Martin Eisenberg. Um, this has been around for, I don't know, at least 10 years or so. Um, and these are, these are exceptionally efficient and well-constructed um, uh, little, they're actually distributed as uh, exe files, so executable files for Windows. Um, and, uh, and they're just incredibly fast. Uh, so if you've got a lot of, you know, LiDAR data gets pretty big pretty quickly. Uh, tens of millions of points is very common. Uh, these days, billions of points is pretty common. So this is definitely big data. Um, and if you're gonna need, if you're gonna work with that, um, you're gonna need efficient ways of doing that. Um, some of these tools include things uh, for classification, for tiling, conversion, filtering, rasterizing, triangulating, contouring, clipping, uh, polygonizing, uh, all kinds of um, all kinds of things that you can do to a point cloud um, to kind of change it from one format to another. Um, these tools um, you can interact with on the command line, which is how I usually do it. Um, I'll open a command window and run uh, last to DEM, uh, for instance, to, to make a rasterized version of a LiDAR point cloud. Um, but if you double click on any of these, it will open up its own kind of integrated GUI, um, which is kind of good. If you've, uh, you're you not quite as familiar with the command line, you can still use these things pretty efficiently uh, on their own. Um, I like the command line. Once you kind of get the hang of it, um, it's, a, it's the fastest way to sort of generate, to, to kind of work with these tools. Um, they're also pretty easy to integrate into other things like Python applications, um, which you can kind of call externally. Um, uh, but, but all of these tools are actually integrated fully uh, into a toolkit that you can use uh, via ArcGIS or QGIS. So um, uh, Eisenberg's done a really great job of sort of making sure these, these tools are accessible in almost any format that you might want. Uh, the upsides to this are that it's really, really fast. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think any other code comes comes close to, to matching the speed of this stuff, um, which means um, you know you can. You don't have to let the stuff sit and run for, for tens of minutes or hours. Um, usually it's done uh, pretty quickly. Obviously it depends on how, how, what your inputs are. Um, but uh, I would, you know, I haven't benchmarked this, but I would put this stuff at probably at least 10 times as fast as equivalent tools in ArcGIS Pro. A um, couple of other upsides. Uh, one is it's got a very quick development time. Um, so this is Eisenberg's only job. He kind of uh, left uh, a position uh, to, to kind of start this company, Rapid Lasso, uh, whose primary purpose is to, is to generate these tools and to do consulting uh, on LiDAR. Um, and so this, it has this complete and full attention and that means that, um, that, means that things uh, improve and update and, and are under development all the time. Um, it's also really easy to chain these things together in some very simple um, scripts called batch files. Um, so a lot of the examples that Eisenberg publishes for more complex workflows are, um, are what are just called batch files, which is a Windows scripting file. Um, and again, runs anywhere, doesn't need any external software. Um, this software is not exactly open source. Uh, in fact, it's not open source, um, but what it is is it's sort of, uh, you know, sort of in the spirit of community using this stuff and, and getting the tools out there. You can download the complete working tool set and use it. Um, uh, the licensing for it uh, for institutions um, can be, uh, I wouldn't say expensive, um, but, uh, but certainly a little bit pricey. Um, but I, they, they more than make up for, for that. Um, they're really, really, um, they're really, really fast. And, and if you want to use these as an individual 
uh, you can do that. Generally what happens is uh, the data gets sort of watermarked uh, in free mode. Um, so you can still run your analysis, you can still generate you know, the information that you need. Um, but if you're sort of trying to get this stuff out for publication, then, um, then you might need to, to uh, license it officially. Uh, it's also only PC only, um, which is a bit of a downside. Um, but, uh, but since you're likely working in ArcGIS anyway, um, that's probably not such a big deal for uh, GIS users. Uh, another really nice toolkit uh, is the Point Cloud Library. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one too much. I'll probably take this slide off by next year, but I wanted to at least mention it as an option. Um, there are a number of sort of parallel programs that have been developed in the last couple of years. Um, PCL is one of the attempts to create sort of a universalized, uh, genuinely open source project for, for processing point cloud data. Uh, it's good, but I, I have other alternatives that I like a little bit better. Um, I think that it's gotten to be a little bit less geographically centric um, and, uh, and, and more robust to dealing with point clouds of sort of, so this is an example of an interior space. Um, and, I, and I think that that, that tends to be more the emphasis. Um, so I don't, I don't personally use PCL that much, uh, although it seems like a great program. Um, this is just a little bit of sort of what it imagines uh, uh, it's, it, it does. Um, so visualization, constructing oak trees, um, doing calculations, uh, registering point clouds, lots and lots of stuff here that you can do. And again, it is, um, it is open source. Uh, it's also uh, quite cross-platform, uh, running not only on Windows, but also Linux, Mac, uh, and Android. Um, so lots of really great um, applications for this. Um, especially, I would say, for the, for the mobile side, um, if you wanted to develop point cloud apps for Android or iOS, um, I would probably start here. Um, this is an example of one of the tools in, um, uh, with the LAS toolkit, uh, with the LAS tools toolkit. Uh, this is LASView. Uh, LASView is a way that you can just sort of very easily um, load a point cloud and, uh, and visualize it and manipulate it. Um, I think in terms of sort of the, the, the footprint of it, um, it doesn't get much better than this. This is about the smallest LiDAR viewer that you can, that you can have. Um, so if all you want to do is just sort of look at your LiDAR data, um, then uh, this is a great toolkit. And you can sort of, here we're, we're sort of scrolling through and, and looking at different ways to colorize it. Um, so you can colorize according to height, you can colorize according to scan rank or intensity or any of the other attributes associated with uh, the point cloud data, uh, the classification. Um, you can you can visualize it that way. Uh, this is a Blacksburg composite LiDAR data set. This is just um, uh, taking a few of the tiles um, near the Blacksburg area from the 2010, uh, 2010, 2012 uh, Blacksburg LiDAR data set uh, downloaded from the VGen interface and then merged, uh, merged together to form kind of a, a bigger single tile to manipulate. Um, what are some examples of using LAS tools? Um, uh, a, a good example is classification. Um, so classification of a point cloud is, is just really important. Um, you want to add some what's called semantic content to this point cloud. You don't want it to just be a bunch of points in space. Even with sort of the attribute information that, that gets generated when you actually make the scans, um, that's not really enough to, 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 to do a lot with. Um, and so oftentimes you're going to need to um, attach some meaning, some classification to these to these clouds. So this is a classification problem. Um, one example of doing this is, is figuring out what, what's ground and what's not. So if I want to make a DTM, digital terrain model, I don't want to use all the points. Uh, I need to throw out the points that don't correspond to the ground. And so to do that, I have to figure out which one is ground. Um, and so, for instance, LAS Tools has a tool to do this. It's called LAS Ground. Um, you can use that to create a DTM, um, a DSM, and a canopy model. Uh, and then you can string that together as part of more analysis. So because this stuff runs in Python or Model Builder, um, you, can use these, uh, you can use these toolkits uh, together and in conjunction with other things to build, um, to build models to, you know, to, 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 even, to classify your data even, but even better. Um, so, uh, this is an example of sort of a model builder model, kind of a layout, um, and uh, feel free to pause the video there and, and kind of check it out and see if you can make sense of generally what it's doing. If you, even if you don't understand all of it, 
um, you, you'll probably understand more of it than you think. You can sort of see input tiles being going here. It goes into a program called LAS Merge. Um, all the LAS tools have this LAS prefix, which is, uh, which is handy. Um, so you can see we're merging all these together and we form a, a, a LAS file and then we turn that into, put that into LAS ground. Uh, we get a ground um, dot LAS back. Um, we can calculate the height from that. We can calculate the height again and we sort of start getting a, a denoised LIDAR and a normalized LIDAR and we turn all of these into different, uh, different products. So um, feel free to, to study that a little bit uh, and just sort of track. Uh, again, you may not understand these particular tools, but this is how you develop that understanding. Um, uh, just sort of take a look at it and see what you think. Uh, one of my favorite toolkits um, for this is um, LAS Color. Uh, so LAS Color is a way that you can um, uh, basically take uh, satellite data um, or aerial photos and attach that information uh, to the XY, uh, XYZ points really. Um, on the point cloud. So you're sort of just doing a, a simple sort of spatial interpolation. Um, you do have to keep in mind uh, that the LiDAR point cloud actually penetrates through light vegetation. Uh, photography does not. So if you're, if you're using a camera to color this, um, you're gonna color everything based on what that camera sees and not what was really there. Um, most of the time, you know, for casual use, it's fine, but you just wanna be a little bit careful, um, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you shoot a LiDAR, uh, generate a point cloud where it's passed through a tree uh, and it hits, let's say, the sidewalk underneath the tree, um, if you use these techniques, you're going to color that sidewalk green um, because that's all the camera could see. Um, if you've got other imagery, if you've got oblique imagery, you can actually you can use that too. Um, and these days, um, a lot of the LiDAR scanners are actually getting paired with the camera right from the get-go, uh, which means they get, um, they get tagged with this RGB information as well. Um, this tool I'm going to talk about um, with LAS Color, um, but that tool, uh, this exact tool essentially does uh, work in ArcGIS Pro. Uh, because I wanted to talk about LAS tools a little bit here, um, we're, we're going to talk about that, but, um, but, but do feel free to try the tool uh, that's in Arc uh, as well. So one of the really um, uh, great ways that you can kind of familiarize yourself with the, um, uh, what you can do with this, uh, there's a, a project out of Connecticut, um, where uh, you can basically look at a statewide colorized LiDAR point cloud. Um, it's, a, it's a fun way to explore. Uh, this is one of the, uh, this, this was produced using ArcGIS Pro. Um, so actually I would encourage you to, to, to pause the video uh, and just pull this up uh, and take a look. Uh, you can either pause it now uh, or pause it kind of when we get to the end of the colorized uh, LiDAR section uh, and just sort of familiarize yourself with what, um, what you can do with this. Um, I'll show you how you can do it. That'll be part of what we're going to talk about in lecture, and you're actually going to get to um, play around with some of these things uh, in your notebook. Um, so to get started, um, when you're when you're pairing LiDAR, so we're, we're going to use LiDAR uh, from uh, Virginia. Uh, this, the, the LiDAR itself was scanned about 10 years ago, uh, and so as a result, what we want to do is we want to try to find imagery um, that corresponds to that year. Uh, if we used um, 2000 20 imagery to color a 2010 LiDAR point cloud, what you'd find is that, is that things have changed maybe more than you'd think. Uh, buildings have gone up, buildings have gone down, uh, trees have been removed, trees have been added. Um, things do change. Uh, and so you really do want to try to match the imagery year uh, with the LiDAR year. Uh, and even so, um, you know, those things are still going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to look at a LiDAR scan of uh, Blacksburg campus. Um, that has been, you know, whatever cars were parked there the day that the LiDAR scan happened um, are going to be different than the cars that were parked there when the, when the NAEP imagery was flown. Um, so you're still going to get some interesting mismatches. Um, so, uh, but the, the closer the better. Um, NAEP imagery you can get from the, um, from the national map, uh, obviously. Uh, I thought it would be worth pointing out that um, a lot of this stuff uh, has been archived um, uh, to a, a box.com folder, uh, which actually makes it easy to, to browse and get. Um, while I do like the, that the national map is sort of a, a one-stop shop, uh, I also like when these extra, um, uh, when these extra data sets are sort of indexed or, or um, stored uh, kind of on their own. Uh, oftentimes that, that makes them kind of optimized and you can really get what you need uh, a little bit faster. So 
I love having these little extra portals uh, available for download. Um, so I said you want to try to match up the imagery. Um, so this is an example of using uh, a program called Last Info on the command line um, to print out um, some of the metadata that gets embedded with a LiDAR file. Uh, LiDAR gets distributed um, as LAS files or LAZ files or ZLAS files. Um, but you can use LAS to all of that stuff as metadata that's embedded in it uh, in, a, in what's called a header. Um, so if you want to peek in that header and take a look at it, um, one of the ways that you can do that is with this program, LAS Info. Uh, within ARC, um, you can also sort of right click and hit properties. Um, if you do that, it spits out, this is actually really nice because it's a really um, uh, high fidelity look at what that header actually looks like. Um, so the file creation day slash year, um, 2010 makes sense. That's the year the, the LiDAR came from. 147 is what's called a Julian day. So a, a Julian day is essentially uh, a numbered day of the year. Um, so you can see that these things get numbered um, 001, 002, 003, moving all the way through. November 1st is day 305. Uh, in the year. Uh, and so this is a, kind of a really handy way of encoding um, uh, a month and a day in a single number that's sequential, uh, meaning, uh, you know, for a lot of computer-based processing, it's a lot easier to compare, you know, this was on July 9th and that was on January 10th. Uh, how many days ago was that or how many days between those? You can just subtract one number from the other. Um, obviously, there are tools to, to programmatically let you do that, um, but it just makes the, the programming side just a, just a hair simpler. Um, so a lot of people like to record these things as Julian days. Uh, each county uh, in the box.com uh, data set uh, for the NAEP imagery is recorded uh, by a FIPS code and everything is organized by year. Um, so here we're just browsing into that. You can see the URL in the title box up here at the top. Um, and uh, so basically what we need to do is sort of figure out what we're looking for, um, go into that year. Um, there is no uh, 2010 data set for Virginia. Um, NAEP imagery is not necessarily flown every year. Uh, and so if you, uh, we're, we're just going to have to get them close enough with the 2009 imagery. So we go, we browse into that directory um, and then essentially we can um, grab uh, whatever we need from there. Um, when you go to download the data, it looks something like this. Um, the data uh, gets distributed as what's called a uh, Mr. Sid file. Uh, it's a um, it's a way of recording uh, imagery. Um, so JPEGs uh, are a good format. Uh, nothing nothing particularly wrong with that. Um, but uh, a lot of the data that we work with in the GIS world is not just RGB. Um, and what, what's good enough to record imagery on your camera uh, is maybe not uh, dense enough um, for a lot of GIS data. So a lot of the stuff when we're imaging, you know, at, at six inch res resolution uh, every year or every other year, that, that, that's a lot of data that we're creating. Um, so as a result, uh, geospatial imagery is often compressed in a, in a, to a very high degree um, in this format called Mr. Sit. Um, Those Mr. Sid files are readable uh, in ArcGIS Pro. Um, other things can read them too, um, but that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, if you want to use uh, these tools to colorize, so if you're using the ArcPro tools, and this is one reason why you might want to use an ArcPro tool, um, it can read the Sid files natively. And so when you do the um, when you do the colorization, it's not a two-step process like I'm going to have to describe here. Um, uh, but in this case, uh, we, what we want to do is take that Mr. Sid data. Uh, and we want to um, essentially extract the section of it that we need that corresponds to our uh, study area. So this is a section that I'm pulling out of the um, uh, out of the area around Blacksburg. Uh, and then I'm using a tool called Project Raster to do the extraction. Um, why would I use Project Raster and not right click and export? Um, well, I want to make sure that I'm setting a couple of things um, exactly the way I want them. Uh, the first thing that I'm setting is the output coordinate system, which I'm choosing to match precisely with my data set. Um, so I want I want the I want the raster that I'm spitting out to be 
in exactly the same coordinate system uh, as my LiDAR data. Um, because I'm using this last uh, color tool um, to do the job, uh, I want to simplify the work um, by, by making sure that my data and my raster uh, are in exactly the same coordinate system. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is, um, is uh, we want to make sure that we are um, uh, pulling out a, uh, we're, we're using a, a resampling technique or an interpolation technique that's going to be best suited for the data. Uh, in this case, um, I want to use a cubic convolution, um, which tends to be the, the highest fidelity um, resampling uh, interpolator uh, in ARC. Um, the linear version of this is the bilinear version it is also very good. Uh, it's only marginally faster. Um, so your, your choice uh, on that is, is kind of up to you. Um, just be very careful that you don't accept uh, the default, which is often nearest to neighbor. Um, and as, uh, as I think we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, nearest neighbor interpolation, while fast, is usually a very low quality. Um, there is some specific cases where you might want to do that. Uh, but in most cases, you would rather um, use a, a bilinear um, resampling tool or a cubic uh, resampler. Um, and if you wanted to kind of review the slides on that, I know we covered that um, a, few, a few lectures ago. So this is an example of a colorized point cloud. Um, this is, again, the Blacksburg uh, composite tile of a series of independent uh, individual tiles uh, stitched together in sort of a a mosaic raster kind of a thing, except it's sort of a mosaic uh, point cloud. And here I'm applying a, what's called a, a shader. Um, so what that does is it sort of um, enhances the appearance of the edges uh, in the image. Um, usually it makes it a little bit easier to see. Uh, building edges and the trees come out a little bit better. Um, uh, when used with the um, colorized tile, it can kind of produce sort of a strange effect um, uh, so it kind of has this like olive-ish uh, color kind of going on here. Um, uh, but the, the, the shader is especially useful um, when you've got, um, uh, when elevation is being used to color the, uh, the image. Um, so that's a, a, a good quick look at um, how last tools uh, can handle this. Um, so we just looked at uh, last color. Um, but uh, plenty of you, many of you are going to want to um, manipulate some point cloud data in ArcGIS. Um, ArcGIS has really kind of come a long way in the last few years uh, with what it can do. Um, ArcScene uh, can display uh, point cloud data just fine. Um, so you can uh, essentially bring in uh, LAS files or um, Esri's proprietary format ZLAS files. Um, and this is really nice, especially when you want to bring in extra um, GIS information. So um, this is going to merge with with base maps. It's going to look good, um, and that's a and that's a great way um, to sort of see how lidar data corresponds to other stuff. Um, a lot of times, I'm just working with a point cloud, um, so things like cloud compare are easier for me. Um, but when um, but when you are sort of um, using the stuff to make GIS related uh, judgments, then um, then ArcScene is a really good option. Um, when, when you drag and drop multiple tiles, uh, the map document looks like this. Um, so here we've just um, brought in uh, six different tiles. ZLAS, or, well, these are actually LAS files, but you could do the same thing with, with ZLAS. Um, and what you see is uh, an outline of those. Um, now, the reason for this is that um, point clouds, um, they're big, right? So there are millions of points in these things. Um, and Esri wants to sort of budget uh, and not overwhelm its graphical engine uh, by trying to display, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of points. It doesn't know how many points you're trying to show, and so it uh, it, it tries to do some of the work for you by uh, by paring that down a little bit. So if you zoom in, um, the uh, the point cloud will appear. So here's an example of that. You zoom into a certain uh, point. Uh, and then the layers kind of tile in. Um, by default, um, we're getting a color mapping here um, with uh, elevation. And you can see, just as the same thing kind of happens with, with DEMs uh, or um, not true color rasters, but if there's sort of a, a symbology applied to your raster, the edges don't quite match up, right? The, the, the symbology is essentially being 
applied at the per tile level. Um, so you can see that the color mapping is not perfect, um, but that's an easy thing. Um, the same techniques that you would use uh, to fix that symbology um, you can use here. Um, the, the basic container uh, in ArcGIS uh, for um, LiDAR files is um, the LAS dataset. Um, so that's a geoprocessing tool, uh, create LAS dataset. You essentially just sort of add the um, LAS or ZLAS files that you're interested in. Um, you, you declare your output LAS dataset. Uh, here it's um, bbird.lasd. Um, you're usually going to want to set the coordinate system. Um, hopefully, it'll pull that in from the um, from the uh, from the metadata. Um, but if not, um, you can you can always look at that data yourself and set it correctly. Um, but I would always just recommend giving that a, a quick look over to make sure it makes sense. Um, I like to do things like compute statistics. I find those things um, to be to be very handy. Um, you can see that there's another option here to create a PRJ for last files. Um, so despite the fact that um, many, but not all, um, I mean, any, any geospatial LAS data set should include projection information in it, but, but I've seen those things be wrong before. Um, and it could be that the, you know, some kind of a processing uh, has been done uh, and for whatever reason that, that metadata got obliterated. Um, so you may need to, you may potentially need to, to, to repair that. Um, and one way that you can repair that instead of writing over the metadata uh, is just to accompany sort of each individual LiDAR tile with a PRJ or projection file. Um, this is a really nice uh, container. Uh, it's, it's a lot like, um, like, a, like a raster mosaic. Um, it, it brings these collections of indiv individual frames together, um, but applies a common symbology. Um, within uh, the symbology tab of an LASD, um, you can utilize a LAS filter that lets you turn on and off different classifications. And actually, I think this is one of the really um, nice features here um, that's, that's a little bit more awkward to use in something like Cloud Compare. Uh, in this case, <clears throat> you can see all of the different attribute information that, that comes with uh, the LiDAR data that you're working with. You can see classification codes. Uh, not only are these not just numeric, um, but you can sort of see what they are, what the class names are. So one is unassigned, two is ground, seven is low noise, and so on. Um, there are a lot more classifications than that, but that's apparently all that exists in our data set, um, which is not uh, not strange at all. Uh, a lot of what happens uh, when, when these things are processed is we try to find the ground. Uh, we try to identify any really weird outliers. Um, we flag those and then everything else is kind of left alone. Uh, and the reason is because uh, algorithms don't do a fantastic job of this anyway. Um, so rather than have a bunch of bad, badly classified points, it's better just to, um, better just to leave them unclassified and then let the user handle that if that's what they want to do. Uh, return values, other, other um, uh, attributes uh, you can put in here as well. Um, uh, but uh, but this is a really nice feature. Again, right clicking, uh, bringing up the symbology, um, and you can uh, you can change things here. Uh, so here's an example of that. Right clicking, uh, bringing in last filters. Uh, we want to just apply the ground. You can see that those building points go away. Uh, next to those, I've got um, uh, we've got just sort of the uh, I guess this is a, coming from the base map, uh, but essentially the the building footprints. Um, so you can you can see those disappear uh, within the footprint. Um, there are lots of tools in ArcGIS Pro to process uh, LiDAR data. Um, uh, it's getting better and better all the time. It's certainly a lot better than it was five years ago uh, or 10 years ago when there basically were, were no tools at all. Uh, when I started working with LiDAR data, um, there, weren't, there weren't any tools at all uh, within the ArcGIS universe. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a nice thing to see these things coming along. It makes it easier for people familiar with GIS to work with it. You don't have to be a specialist anymore um, to start doing it. Uh, that said, um, I don't use um, these tools myself um, often. Um, the reason is, is that most of the data that I process tends to be pretty big, um, sort of multiple steps of processing. And so I often rely on LAS tools, uh, increasingly relying on PDAL and tools that sort of uh, exist within the Python universe. Um, but, uh, but it's really nice to know that these things are here. 
And the, the quality of these tools, um, they really are getting better all the time. And in particular, you know, it, uh, it may be that, that using, um, just because Mr. Sid tends to be the most common distribution format, using the colorized last tools um, within ArcGIS Pro may be a better option um, than, even, um, than even the last tools version. Um, within the last few years, there have been some really neat advancements of getting um, LiDAR viewable on the web. Um, so one of these tools that exists is called plaz.io. Um, this is uh, a really nice toolkit. Um, you can see some examples of this uh, online. You can load your own um, LiDAR data sets. Um, so in this case, uh, this is a, a model of Half Dome uh, at uh, Yosemite. Um, really, really neat way of interacting with this. And, and I'll show you an example of, uh, of poetry, which I actually use a little bit more often. Uh, all it takes to make this happen, um, you can browse. In this case, there are a few sample data sets that come uh, on the on the web page, but you can actually open your own. Uh, you can manipulate the slider to add more or less density. Um, you can change things like um, the, how the camera works, um, what, the, what the particle size is. Um, so you're essentially imagining these things as either sort of spheres uh, or little tiny squares um, and so you can change the size of those um, you can change uh, essentially the color maps you can either use an rgb or you can use classification um, you can define an intensity source um, the intensity that comes off of a, a point cloud or lidar point cloud particularly can be weird um, so you can you can scale those values to make them kind of make a little bit more sense to enhance the contrast um, so really nice toolkit uh, a tool that I use a little bit more often is Poetry. Uh, so Poetry is uh, same kind of thing. It's a, it's a web-based viewer. Um, uh, this, was, this came out of some um, uh, PhD work only just a couple of years ago, and it's kind of taken the, the LiDAR visualization world by storm. Um, relatively easy to set up. Um, essentially, it's a, it runs on a web server. Uh, it loads. Uh, you have to convert your LiDAR file to, uh, to a Poetry-based format. Um, and then it's actually pretty easy. Uh, so if you go to uh, poetry.org, um, you can sort of take a look at a, at a bunch of different examples. Uh, and the whole GitHub project is also available, um, and, it, and that's true for plaz.io as well. Um, so if you're, you're into the coding, you can actually take a, a deep look into how this stuff works. Uh, this is an example of kind of browsing through some of the examples on the um, poetry.org website. Um, we'll look at a, an example here. Um, uh, this is a this is just a simple point cloud. It's not geospatial, but it's a but it's a point cloud uh, of a of a uh, lion. Uh, pretty neat looking. Um, and here I'm just kind of looking through the options, uh, looking at the things you can do. You can make measurements directly uh, on here, uh, directly in the browser. Um, there are angular measurements. You can define things like profiles. Uh, and sort of see how that comes out on the resulting back end. Um, you can do this uh, with different kinds of color representations. So this is kind of a, a colorized version, um, but you can visualize by height, um, a color ramp that corresponds to height if you want. Uh, lots of really neat stuff. Uh, this is Entwine, uh, a kind of a, a sister project. Uh, Entwine is a uh, more efficient way of streaming extremely large tiles. Um, there's some really neat sort of big, big examples of this. Uh, the whole state of Iowa, for instance, all of its LiDAR data, um, you can browse in a seamless uh, online web version. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are interested in this stuff, Kentucky as well, um, lots of really big areas. And, and I expect at some point, once the United States as a whole gets imaged, uh, we'll be able to do that. It'll be a little unfortunate since it's going to be sort of multiple different time epochs, but um, 
still uh, a neat experience. Uh, this is an example of Poetry um, uploaded to my lab's uh, server, so you're welcome to check this out. This is at neareearthimaginglab.org slash poetry slash blacksburg.html. Um, so this is the same tile we've been working with. Um, again, you can, you can make measurements, uh, you can define profiles, you can clip, you can export, you can change the appearance, lots of really uh, neat stuff. So here I'm drawing a profile. Um, you can bring that profile up and sort of see what that looks like. Uh, it's a really neat visualization. Um, you can change that to RGB, or sorry, you can change that to um, uh, elevation if you want to bring out some detail there, which I think is even cooler looking. Um, so really, really fun ways of um, just quickly visualizing uh, places. It's a, it's a really, it's a really neat, fun way to, to experience the, uh, the LiDAR point cloud. Uh, you can turn on and off classifications. Um, so if your data has been classified, as this one has, um, then uh, then you can you can switch that on and off as well. Uh, another um, uh, lidar toolkit that I'm that I'm getting increasingly um, interested in uh, and have used several times is PDAL. Uh, the authors of this call it Poodle. Um, it's the Point Data Abstraction Library. Really great toolkit. Uh, runs on the command line. Integrates with Python. Um, really really well-written software that um, is part of the sort of open source geospatial um, pipeline, processing pipeline. Uh, it merges with GDAL, which is sort of a raster-based processing toolkit. Um, really, really great project. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun to see this um, really kind of taking off in the last couple of years. Um, another uh, online version of uh, sort of like Poetry or um, Plaza.io is Cesium. Um, Cesium uh, was kind of a open source project, I think, and then, um, but now it's kind of become a, um, kind of spun up into a business, um, and uh, they're sort of <clears throat> making a play at being sort of the um, the best uh, online lidar, and, and even more than lidar, sort of 3D um, building information model, integrated, fully seamless web delivery, VR, you name it. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat project. Um, I haven't used this much myself, um, but I think it's got a lot of uh, I think it's got a lot of promise. Um, we have um, mostly looked at point clouds so far, but there are a lot of products uh, that come out of point clouds. Um, we've focused a little bit on digital terrain models and digital surface models, uh, but one really nice piece of information that you can get out of the stuff uh, are meshes. Um, so meshes are where we sort of um, connect up different vertices. Uh, we can take our sort of irregular point cloud and we apply a surface to them. On the right uh, is an image of a, a model of a bunny. This is the, uh, the famous Stanford bunny, uh, often used for, for benchmarking uh, different kinds of uh, mesh processing software. Uh, and a mesh is essentially just sort of a, a more flexible version of a tin, right? So you can see that these are triangles that are connected up. All of that works exactly like a tin does. So you can imagine a tan as sort of a special case uh, of, a, of a mesh. Um, this is a tricky problem. Um, so the, you know, the, the process by which we sort of draw, if we've got a, a series of points, the process by which we sort of draw a, a polygon around them is tricky and has a lot more subjectivity than you would think. Um, one easy thing that you can calculate off of a, a collection of points is called the convex hull. Um, so most Geospatial programs can do this, ARC can do it, lots of things can do it. Um, essentially, the idea here is you're finding sort of a, um, uh, a set of points. I, I like to tell students, you know, imagine if you, if you wrapped a, a rubber band around these points, where would that rubber band go? Uh, it's kind of looking for the sort of lowest energy state. Um, but that doesn't really describe the shape very well, uh, especially if there are holes or if there's sort of um, is concavity in the data. Uh, as, as many of us would see. And so um, as a human, if you were told to draw a point, a draw lines around the perimeter of this set of points, you might draw something like an alpha shape, um, which is a, a kind of a technical way of expressing this idea of sort of drawing a, a, a minimum bounding polygon uh, that's sort of a, the smallest and yet correct uh, polygon around, the, around your, your set of points. Um, as I said, this has more. This has uh, a convex hull is generated without any parameters. Uh, it's purely driven by the data, 
an alpha shape sort of has this tuning factor, that you, a knob essentially that you can tune to decide how aggressively uh, or how irregularly um, those outside points uh, can be. Um, the, the alpha shape problem is essentially compounded when you when you try to do this in three dimensions. If you try to draw um, the if you try to texture the, the sides of a building, um, it, it gets tricky, especially where the point cloud is a little bit um, weird. Uh, and so uh, the the model on the left actually looks pretty good, uh, but as you kind of zoom into these um, smokestacks, you can see some some very strange things that have happened as a result of the um, as a result of the process. Uh, another really uh, important um, application uh, for generating these point clouds is terrestrial LIDAR. So, so far, most of the stuff that we've been showing has been, uh, let me pause this here. Uh, the, um, most of what we've seen so far has been aerial uh, or airborne LIDAR. Uh, the, the reason for this is that you can re really cheap, relatively cheaply image really large areas um, but we did say that, that the sides of buildings don't get imaged very well. And so uh, terrestrial LIDAR is getting big. Uh, mobile LIDAR um, is often differentiated as a type of terrestrial LIDAR. So, so there have been instruments that are sort of placed on tripods and collect the environment. You sort of have to move the tripods around. But the newer stuff essentially um, can be mounted to a vehicle or a backpack. Um, this unit that, you're, that we're looking at here uh, is one we use in our lab. Um, this is uh, Velodyne HDL32E. Uh, it's the same uh, toolkit that's used to drive a lot of autonomous vehicles uh, and robot vision applications. Uh, a really interesting flexible um, unit. Um, what, what you get out of that unit though is not an assembled point cloud. Um, this is uh, an example of a, of a scan that we did. Um, we mounted it to a vehicle and uh, here we're kind of driving around and you can see that it's picking picking up the environment in this sort of ring-like shape, um, and uh, so uh, it, it's not at all really like uh, like we're really used to seeing that these things have to be assembled. Um, the way in which that's done uh, is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, there are algorithms called SLAM algorithms, which stand for simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, the idea behind these is that um, we are sort of at the same time we're, we're navigating, we're building a map, uh, and this is kind of what we, we imagine people doing. Uh, and so there are a couple of really interesting examples of this. Um, down below is an image um, where a person has um, mounted a LiDAR unit actually to, the, to a helmet uh, and is just running around the environment and, and creating, this, uh, creating this really gorgeous map uh, on the back end. Um, Really, really cool uh, projects. Uh, the stuff is, is getting better and better all the time. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this stuff kind of pans out in the future. Um, one of the problems with uh, the development of good SLAM algorithms on the open source side is that these things are actually quite valuable. Um, so whether it's for robotic applications or mapping applications, there's a lot of money to be made um, by uh, developing systems that can do this. And so Route Scene has a LiDAR pod that's basically powered off of one of these things. Uh, Carta, uh, which is the company um, kind of behind the, the, the guy running with the, the unit mounted on his head is, is another one. Uh, here's an example of one of those units being used for a robot vision application in, in Boston, in a Boston Dynamics robot. Um, there's just, it, it's just really valuable. And so that makes it challenging for open source to to compete, um, all of the best um, scientists and engineers, you know, you, you, you write a PhD or master's thesis on it and uh, sort of instantly scooped up by industry. Uh, and so very little of that code base has a chance to make it out into the public. Um, one really nice um, uh, bright spot to this is that is that Google has been working um, on their own SLAM algorithms. Uh, this is Google's cartographer, um, which takes um, a, uh, a Velodyne sensor and turns it into a point cloud. Uh, really interesting technology. Um, this is all because they, you know, are working on self-driving cars, um, and so generating maps uh, is an important kind of uh, subset uh, of that problem. Uh, SLAM using the uh, robot operating system uh, is uh, is another good option. 
Uh, so cartographer integrates with this. Um, the idea is that uh, making maps is sort of uh, one aspect of building um, important parts about how robots relate to their environments. Uh, and so ROS, or the Robot Operating System, is one kind of big open source project where a lot of these things uh, come together. Uh, some of the new stuff that's being developed is called Geiger Mode LiDAR. So Geiger Mode um, has the uh, potential to um, generate really, really high resolution LiDAR point clouds. Um, a lot of the point clouds that you'll get and use now, um, maybe stuff that was gathered within the last 10 years, will produce point clouds on the order of 5 to 15 points per square meter. Uh, that depends on the instrument and how low the aircraft flew and how fast it flew. Um, but, uh, but the newer stuff, uh, this, this newer Geiger, uh, Geiger mode LiDAR has the potential to, to produce point densities up to 100 points per square meter. Um, so uh, things look a lot realer uh, when, when you can really jack up the resolution, especially things like trees or really detailed rooftops. Um, so it simplifies um, some of the, the problems associated with, uh, you know, I guess geospatial people are always spoiled every time we get a new advance uh, like LiDAR. Um, that's great. And then pretty soon we start complaining that it's not quite the resolution that we want uh, and we'd like it to be a little bit better. So um, that, uh, that seems to be true uh, all the time. Um, one really um, fascinating uh, piece of technology, uh, and, I, and I won't play the video here, uh, well, let's let's give it a try. Uh, yeah, I think we're having some some technical difficulties here, but the URL is here, uh, or Google Oliver Kralos uh, immersive lidar. Uh, you can take a look at this stuff. Um, it's a really fantastic way of using. Uh, in this case, he's using an HTC Vive um, to fully embed uh, into a point cloud and manipulate it and take measurements. Uh, a very interesting uh, project. Uh, Cloud Compare actually has the ability to do this. Um, so Cloud Compare, which you'll be using in your notebooks a lot, which I've talked about in lecture, um, can uh, get you into a point cloud and you can look at stuff and it's immersive and it's a lot of fun. Um, so if you're interested in this stuff, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to hook you up uh, with that. Uh, or you know, if you've got an Oculus, uh, you can try this stuff on your own. So uh, to wrap things up, um, you know, we, we've covered a lot of different aspects of LiDAR in the last three lectures. Um, you're going to get a chance to practice a lot of this stuff in the notebooks. Uh, you will get a chance to download and use LAS tools. Uh, you'll get a chance to uh, colorize point clouds uh, with LAS tools and ArcGIS Pro. Um, you'll get a chance to view uh, data in uh, Arc Pro and make some calculations of a DTM. Uh, and uh, you, you may get a chance to do uh, a little bit of LAS tools within ArcGIS um, if, uh, if that's of interest to you. So we'll wrap things up there. Uh, I hope that was a good introduction to LiDAR. Um, and uh, if you have questions, certainly see me. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll wrap things up and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.